Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming on such a beautiful day. It's my very great pleasure uh, on behalf of the Woodrow Wilson School Center for Health and Wellbeing to introduce Dr. Richard Besser, the Chief Health and Medical Editor for ABC News. Um, before I do that, let me just give a brief advertisement for the Center for Health and Wellbeing, which is the center at Princeton that's charged with promoting research and teaching related to health policy. We've been around since 2000, and we're doing lots of interesting things if you want to check out our website. So Dr. Besser provides medical analysis and commentary for all ABC news broadcasts and platforms, including World News with Diane Sawyer, Good Morning America, and Nightline. In 2011, he led ABC's global health coverage, Be the Change, Save a Life, reporting on health issues from seven different countries. Dr. Besser came to ABC News in 2009 from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, where he served as the director of the Coordinating Office for Terrorism Preparedness and Emergency Response. In that role, he was responsible for all of the CDC's public health emergency preparedness and emergency response activities. From January to June 2009, Dr. Besser served as acting director for CDC and acting administrator for the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. It was during that time that he led CDC's response to the H1N1 influenza outbreak and he learned the critical importance of communication for shaping perceptions of that crisis and health behaviors. As a result of his efforts, people increased actions to protect their health. Dr. Besser has taken that experience to ABC News, where he is now practicing public health in front of the camera. In his talk today and in his new book, Tell Me the Truth, Doctor, he will explain why in health the biggest impacts can be made by talking rather than testing. His talk today is entitled Pandemics, Public Health and Political Change, The Critical Importance of Communication. And it will be followed by a book sale and signing, which will be just to the side here, as well as by a public reception in the Schultz Dining Room, which is on the other side of this room. So please join me, without further ado, in welcoming Dr. Besser. Thanks very much. It's it's uh, it's always great to come back to Princeton. I'm I'm uh, I'm from Princeton. I'm local. My parents are here, uh, as are lots of their friends. I think. <laughs> thank you all from uh, thank thanks to the Windrose contingent. Uh, but I love I love coming back to to Princeton to to talk. Uh, what I want to do today is, is talk about uh, communication and the importance, I think, of, of communication in, in driving change in, in, in people's health behaviors. Um, and I'll do that the way I, I do things at ABC, which is mainly through, through telling stories. Um, I guess it was about 16 days ago, I was uh, uh, in the border area between Hong Kong and China. And uh, I was standing there, and there were 15 Hong Kong technicians wearing white lab coats and goggles and gloves and big rubber boots. And they were reaching into the back of this truck that had about 1,000 chickens in it. And at random, they were pulling out a chicken, taking it up to the table, drawing blood, doing a swab of, of, the, of the chicken's butt putting these into a vial um, and, and doing testing for the new bird flu strain, the H7N9 virus. And I was there covering Hong Kong preparedness for this new bird flu. And it just, it struck me as a surreal experience. I never would have imagined five years ago that I would be in a setting of a, of a new outbreak of disease, covering it for, for television instead of being the person responding to the outbreak. Um, so I want to go back and explain a little bit how I got into this position um, and, and what I learned from response to uh, the last pandemic that, that our country faced and why I think it is so incredibly important that those of us in public health focus on communication and direct communication to the public if we want to, if we want to improve health. 
So going back four years, uh, it was January of 2009. I was, uh, I was at the CDC, I was in charge of emergency uh, preparedness and response. And I was on a study trip to Israel. And we had gone to Israel, it was a Harvard-sponsored group, uh, government officials, and we'd gone there to try and understand why are the Israelis so well prepared for any disaster? They, they knew exactly what to do. If there, was, if there was a bombing, they knew how to respond. If there was an outbreak, they knew how to respond. They were ready for anything. But in America, whenever you do a survey of preparedness, you find that about 5% of people have an emergency response kit or emergency communication plan, any of the things that you need to do to respond to, to a disaster, very few Americans were ready. So we arrived in Israel. About two hours after we arrived in Israel, the Israelis went to war in Gaza. And there were bombings going on. And we're thinking, oh, the Israelis, they're going to cancel our, our study trip. There's no way that the leaders of response are going to have the time to talk to us when they're going through this big response activity in Gaza. Well, the, one of the key things we learned in Israel is that when there's a crisis, you don't let it affect your day-to-day -day life. And so our meetings went on. And we were meeting with the head of emergency response and the head of the hospital system and their top epidemiologists. And they were talking to us about preparedness. And what became clear was the reason they are so prepared for a disaster or the next pandemic or the, or the next major whatever is that they face that every day. And they have, you know, they face thousands of bombings. You know, here in this country, we saw how disruptive and catastrophic one bombing in Boston was. But in Israel, that's the life of people in cities all the time. And so people prepare. They know what to do. But in America, that's not been our life. And here, you, you prepare for what you're used to. So if you're in the Midwest, you may prepare for tornadoes. If you're in the Florida coast, you may prepare for hurricanes. Um, but you don't prepare for major disasters if it's not what you've experienced. So we're having these meetings with the Israelis. And they're giving us these lectures. And, and my phone goes off. So I step out of the meeting, and, and it's, it's someone from the Obama transition team, a, a friend of mine. And she says, you know, Rich, if you were asked to be the acting director of the CDC, what would you say? And I said, I'd say yes. And she said, OK, I'll get back to you. <laughs> so I go back into the meeting. We, get, we have the lectures. The next day, you know, we're in there again, and my phone goes off. And I, I come out, and she says, Rich, it's down to you and one other person. And now I had questions. I wanted to know, you know, I'd, I'd been thinking about this a little bit. She said, I said, so, you know, how long would I have this job? What would you want me to do? And she'd say, well, I think you'd be acting director for about six weeks. And during those six weeks, we'd want you to treat it like you were the real director of the CDC and do whatever you thought the agency needed during those six weeks. And you know, after six weeks, we'd have a secretary in place and they'd be able to nominate, they'd be able to put in the permanent director of CDC. And I said, well, this sounds, this sounds pretty good. And she said, now don't tell anyone about this. I said, OK. So I got off the phone, immediately called my wife, and told her everything. <laughs> right? right? I mean, I figured that didn't count when you're talking about the, um, the, you know, the cone of silence. And I started thinking about you know, what would I do as the, as the acting director of, of, of CDC. Um, she called back the next day and said, yes, it's you. We don't know when you would start the job, but uh, you'll be the acting director of CDC. So I came back from, from, from Israel. And uh, the inauguration was on, on a Tuesday. And then two days later, I was, uh, I was in clinic. I'm a, I'm a general pediatrician. And I still see patients. And uh, I was in there. I was examining a teenager. And, and my phone went off. And so I stepped out of the room. And it was uh, the head of personnel from, from uh, Health and Human Services. And uh, he said, you know, uh, is this Dr. Besser? I said, yes. He said, you're now the acting director of the CDC. <laughs> and I said, you know, is there someone I can talk to about this? And he said, we'll get back to you. <laughs> so that began my tenure as the, as the, as the acting director. I would used this, this week of prep time to, to reread my favorite leadership book, which is Good to Great, and uh, learned about you know, who, sh who I sh would want to have on my leadership team and how to get them in place. And, the other book I read was What to Do During Your First 100 Days of Government. And there's a list of questions you're supposed to, to work through. And I had my questions all laid out. And uh, the next day, I went to Washington. 
And there, uh, I met with uh, a guy, Mark Childress, who was the chief of staff for the non-existent secretary. We didn't have a secretary yet. It was two days into the administration. And one, what, what I learned in my, in my 100 days of, of government book was one of the questions you ask is you know, how your agency is viewed. So I said to him, when you look at CDC, do you see an agency in need of major change, minor change, or stabilization? And I'm thinking he's going to say, you know, minor change. There's a, quite a few things we need to, you know, to fix. He said, major change. And I said, why? What, what, what major change do you, need, do you see at the agency? And he said, for too long, you focused on low probability, high consequence events, things that are unlikely to happen but could cause major harm, like pandemics. But you haven't focused on those things that are causing harm to people right now heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity. He said, you need to take the resources that you're putting into preparedness and focus more on today's health problems. And I said, why in public health do we have to choose between the two? Why can't we be working on today's health problems and be preparing for something catastrophic? And he said, there's not enough money. And right now, the balance is wrong. You need to shift. And, and focus on, on, on these health problems. So I had my marching orders, went back to Atlanta. We began working on the stimulus package. And in there, there was a lot for prevention programs, a lot to tackle obesity and diabetes and cancer, and much less focus on, on, on preparedness. And things went along uh, quite well. Uh, for me and my job, they didn't go so well for Tom Daschle, who was supposed to be the next Secretary of Health. Um, when it came for his confirmation, they found that he had not paid taxes on a bunch of car rides from his, his business. And so, and the administration did not want to go through another, another confirmation battle. They had just been through one. And so he was pushed to the side. And so there was no secretary of, uh, of health for, for quite some time. And April came along, and it was the middle of April. And my acting deputy, a uh, good friend of mine said, Rich, I think you should come to our pandemic preparedness meeting on Wednesday. And we've been, we have been having a weekly pandemic preparedness meeting for about three years. And the reason for that was a strain of flu, of bird flu, called H5N1, which had shown up in Asia. And it was found to be about 50% fatal. Very bad strain of, of, of flu. It was, very, it was even worse for the birds. Um, uh, it was, it was, uh, you could see where it was, because there would be massive bird die-offs where, where that was happening. Um, in order for a pandemic to occur, three things have to be in place. You need a strain of flu that the population hasn't seen, so that there's very little, if any, immunity in the population. You need a strain of flu that causes disease in humans. And you need a strain that passes easily from person to person. Well, this strain of bird flu, it definitely caused disease in people. Um, it definitely was one that the population was not immune to, but it didn't spread easily from person to person. And so we thought it was a ticking time bomb. And so we'd been working. We'd been exercising. There was a federal response, response plan to, to bird flu. There was a, you know, a strategic plan, an operational plan. There were state plans, departmental plans. CDC, we had our plan. We'd been giving money to the states. They had their own plans. They were all exercising on, the, on these plans. And uh, what, my, what my deputy said was, you know, we're concerned. There have been two cases of flu in San Diego that are a swine-associated flu. So when you look at influenza, there's certain strains that affect people. There's some that get birds, and there's some that get pigs. And the problem is when they start to mix and match. Then you can get the pandemic strains. And she said, in San Diego, there have been two, strain, two infections of swine-associated flu. And they weren't in people who had close contact with pigs. We're worried about that. I said, well, you know, have we seen swine flu before? And she said, well, in the past decade, there have been about 10 cases of swine flu, but they've all been in people in close contact with pigs. I said, OK, uh, you know, I'll, come, I'll come to the meeting. At the same time, in Mexico, we were hearing about a, a widespread pneumonia 
that was filling hospitals, and people were very worried, and they had not identified what the organism was that was causing this pneumonia. Um, and the big question was, could it be the same flu that we were seeing in, in, in San Diego? By the time I went to the meeting on Wednesday, there were now two cases of swine-associated flu in Texas. And I'm an epidemiologist as well as a pediatrician, and it, the likelihood that these events could be taking place and would be independent, not related, the probability of that was very, very small. And so we were very worried. We had, we had received at CDC uh, and isolate uh, or, or samples, clinical samples from Mexico. The Canadians had received them a little uh, ahead of us, and we were waiting to see whether these samples tested positive for, for swine flu. Um, at the meeting with the flu group, they said, we're very concerned that this could be a strain that has pandemic potential. And they had put out a call in the MMWR, which is the CDC journal, to get health departments looking for this. Uh, everyone was geared up to, to look for this. And I sent word up to, to Washington. Uh, we still had no Secretary of Health. I said, you know, I think we need to have a call about this. We're concerned about a, a, a strain of flu that's appearing in the US and about these cases of, of, uh, of respiratory disease in Mexico. And the message I got back was, we're kind of busy. Uh, could we wait until tomorrow? And so I sent another message up, and I said, no, I don't think so. I, we're concerned this could be the start of the next pandemic. We think the White House should, should know about this. And so we had a call. We, we had a call that night. At that point, Canada had already identified that the, the flu in Mexico was the same strain of H1N1 flu that we were seeing in, in the US. And so I laid this out. We now had a new chief of staff in Washington, still no secretary of health. And I laid out the concerns. We have this strain that's spreading. There's no population immunity. In Mexico, it looks like it's highly fatal. Um, we're very concerned. I said, we're concerned this could be the next pandemic. And there was silence on the phone. There was a woman, Laura Petru, who was the, the new chief of staff for the non-existent yet secretary. And uh, she said, on a scale of 1 to 10, how worried are you? So I'm thinking, you know, I never learned a pandemic worriedness scale. Um, <laughs> but I was pretty worried. And so I said, an eight. She said, an eight? I'm thinking, like, what, she knows what an eight is versus this? <laughs> but she, I said, yes. He said, we're very concerned this could be the next, uh, the next pandemic. And she says, OK, I'm notifying the White House. And I get off the phone, and, and uh, my friend who was on the call, he's head of our emergency operations center, he calls me and he says, an eight? I said, what do you mean an eight? He says, I don't think it's any more than a six. And I was like, <laughs> I said, you know, Phil, if I'd said six, I'm not sure she would have called the White House. And I wanted her to call the White House. And you know, it kind of drove home one of the messages of communication, is that you communicate in a way that gets the reaction and the action that you're looking to see. And an eight got the action that we were looking to see. We activated our emergency operations center. And the next day, we, we kicked it all in gear. And when we respond to, a, to a, an outbreak of a new disease at CDC, uh, you know, that's, what, that's what the agency is, is, is best known for, uh, outbreak response. And especially when you're dealing with a new disease, there are certain principles that you follow. Um, you don't know at the start of an outbreak really how severe it's going to be. And so you come at it strong. You come at it very aggressively. And you know that if you don't jump on it very quickly, you may miss any opportunity to, to, to get ahead of it. Um, and there are things you do. You do case finding. You do surveillance looking for more disease. You provide clinical guidance to, to hospitals. Uh, you, you provide guidance on infection control. A lot of what you do at CDC is providing support to state and local health departments who are really doing, doing the work. Um, but one of the things that we, we did that was a little different was we decided that communication was going to be a central part of what we did. We wanted people to get their information from CDC. If they got information from anywhere, we wanted it to come from us so that we knew that they were getting the best information available. And in order for that to be the case, we were going to tell people what we knew when we knew it. We were going to not turn down any interviews from media outlets. 
We were going to brief the media on a regularly scheduled basis. When we didn't know the answer, we were going to tell people what we, we were going to say we don't know the answer to that and tell people what we were doing to, to, to get the answer. Strategically, it was clear to us on the first day that containment of this was not possible. Now, I said that there was a, a federal plan for H5N1 for the other bird flu. And there, the scenario that we'd been exercising for years, we've been doing these, these multiple day exercises for, for years, was that this would start in Indonesia, preferably on a little island off of Java or somewhere, somewhere remote. And then you'd be able to fly in with, with public health teams and, and distribute Tamiflu or other antivirals and get working on a vaccine and put up border control in the US so that you could slow the entry into the United States. Because if, if you want to reduce the mortality in a, in a pandemic, what you want to do is flatten it out. You may, you may not be able to uh, reduce the number of people who get sick, but if they don't all get sick at once, then your hospitals, your healthcare system are going to be able to take care of more people, and you're going to see fewer deaths. And so that was the scenario we'd been working on. But when this pandemic started, it was already in the United States. So I got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of uh, uh, questions from media at the time saying, you know, why aren't you closing the border? And it's like, well, you know, other countries could say that about us because it's in the US. Uh, there's no way to keep it out of the border if it's already in the border. And flu can spread even before it's symptomatic. And we were already seeing cases in California, in, in Texas. There was a big school outbreak at the time in, in, in New York. Um, and so containment was not part of the strategy. We were going to make all of our actions directed at those things that were most likely to save lives and reduce the burden uh, uh, on, on people's health. We are going to be aggressive until we knew that we could back off. And we were going to base, we were going to take actions based on the best available science. And early on, we knew that the science was going to be very limited. We were going to need to take action based on limited information. Um, we were going to share what we knew, not just with the American uh, uh, people, but with health agencies around the world and try and foster that kind of openness all, uh, uh, all around. We knew that the guidance that we put up was going to be temporary and that people were going to find information up on our websites and other places that at times was wrong. And we were going to do what it took to, to get that right as quickly as possible. And so we launched our communication strategy. Um, one of the critical things about communication and why it's so important is you can take all of the right actions, do all of the right steps, but if you lose the trust of the American people, you failed in a response. Likewise, you can take all the right actions, but if, you've, if you're in government, if you've lost the, the, the trust of leadership above you, you failed as well. And communication is, is critical to, to all, of those, all of those aspects. So, you know, we looked at communication in a number of different ways. There was the communication that went out to the public through, through our press conferences. And I was on the morning shows, the evening shows. I was doing press conferences all of the time, um, trying to let people know that there was a shared responsibility. There were things that people could do to protect their health. There were things that communities needed to do, families needed to do, and there were things that government needed to do. But there were actions that people could take. And that was very reassuring to people. Uh, people who felt powerless because there's this unknown infection spreading, the idea that there are actually things you can do to protect your health was so, gave, gave people some power and, and, and helped deal with some of the fear. Communication up to the White House uh, and to government was also a key, a key part of this. Um, three days into this, I got a call from, from the White House. They said, we want you to come to Washington for, for a press conference. I said, okay, so I went, went to the White House and uh, met in the, in the situation room with uh, John Brennan. He's now head of the CIA, but he was the national security advisor at the time, and Janet Napolitano, who's the Secretary of, of Homeland Security. In a major disaster, the Department of Homeland Security is in charge. And the reason is that in a major disaster, it's not just a health event. It, shuts to, it, it can affect transportation and commerce and, and agriculture, and, and it really cuts all the way across. Uh, but at this point, it wasn't declared a national disaster, but she was there uh, to be able to talk about the national response plan. So we're in the briefing room. I was there with my one press guy from CDC. Secretary Napolitano had a whole team with her, 
as did Secretary, uh, as did uh, uh, John Brennan, the, the security advisor. And he said, okay, any questions about terrorism? He says, I'll take those. Any questions about the National Response Plan? Secretary Napolitano, you take those. Any questions about science or the outbreak? Dr. Besser, you take those. So we go out into the, the, the press briefing room, and I would say 95% of the questions were about the outbreak and, and about science. And things were going pretty well. Um, you know, I was giving the same messages I've been giving in the, in the press briefings about you know, aggressive action and uncertainty, and everyone had a role and responsibility. And then there was this reporter from, from Fox News. <laughs> hey, she was sitting in the front. And she said, Dr. Besser, is there a chance that this could be terrorism? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, you know, our, our lab always considers that. But when they look at this strain of flu, it looks like uh, what we would see in a naturally occurring event. Uh, Dr. Besser, isn't there a possibility that someone in a laboratory designed this strain and released it on the world? And John Brennan came up to the microphone and said, well, we've been listening to chatter out there, and we don't hear any signs that there's been a terrorist activity. There's nothing out there to make us think that there's uh, anyone who's been working on this and, and done this. I said, uh, Dr. Besser, isn't it possible that a laboratory released this somewhere, either accidentally or deliberately, and that this is a, a, a plot, uh, that this is a terrorist act? And again, I said, you know, this is exactly what we would see with a naturally occurring pandemic. And I think she asked it one more time. But it, it led to... The, the media coverage that my kids liked the most. Because the next night on The Daily Show, <laughs> John Stewart replayed that, that scene and kind of sped it up. So it was like, Dr. Besser, Dr. Besser, Dr. Besser, Dr. Besser, where she's, she's asking me this question over and over again. And finally, he said, he said no. <laughs> and then that, that was, uh, of, of all of the times I was on television, that was the one that my, my, kids, uh, my kids really liked, liked the most. Uh, so we went forward with our, with, our, with our response, and we still didn't have a, we didn't have a Secretary of Health. And it, it actually made us very nimble. You know, in government, when you are developing policy, uh, there's all kinds of clearance that has to take place. It has to go up within your agency to the department, and then it has to be cross-cleared in other departments. Well, we didn't have a secretary, which meant we didn't have deputy secretaries or assistant secretaries. We could look at the science, write a guidance, do a policy, get it up on the web in like three, four hours. I mean, we were fast. And in an outbreak setting, speed really matters, because there was a lot that we had to be doing. And it was just great. Um, I'll tell a different story. So, uh, so, so we're going, we're going strong. I get a call. It says, you know, uh, Rich, uh, uh, we want you to come and, and brief the, the president and the, and the cabinet. And so I said, fine. This is going to be on a Friday. The next day, Secretary Sebelius was confirmed. And uh, uh, her office called and said, you know, meet at her office before going over to the White House. We'll go over together. So I go to the secretary, new secretary's office. We've been talking uh, before she was confirmed and, and, and worked really, really well together. And, and she was driving a lot of the response at that point. Um, so we come to her office, and I, you know, her people are there. They're new staff. And I say, OK, can anyone tell me how you brief the president and the cabinet? And they said, no, no. Um, because they were brand new. They had no idea. I said, well, how long should I brief them for? And they said, Five to seven minutes. It's like, OK. So off we go to the, to the White House. And uh, we arrive there. And we go up into the cabinet room. And I'm, I'm a bit of a political junkie. I love, I love following politics. And so I walk in the room. And there's all these people. The whole cabinet's there. I thought the cabinet like, meets every Thursday. You know, they get together. They plan out what they're going to do the next week. You know, they, they talk. This was only the second meeting of the cabinet. It was 100 days into Obama's term. And it was the first meeting of the full cabinet, because Secretary Sebelius had just been confirmed. And I, I come in, and uh, they're all there. And I look over, and there's Peter Orzag, Princeton Connection. His, his father's a professor here. Um, he's standing off kind of by, by himself. And he was the only one there who's about my height. So you know, I go over to him. And he has the worst job in government. He's head of the Office of Management and Budget. So he's in charge of every department's budget. 
Uh, no one likes him <laughs> because his job is to say no, right? It's, it's just a horrible job. And, and so I go over and he's standing there, he's looking kind of grim. And I say, I say, you sure have a stressful job. I said, my job's only stressful when there's a pandemic. And he said, yeah, you know, I've been doing some reading and you know, the average tenure of a uh, director of the Office of Management and Budget is, is 18 months. <laughs> and sure enough, it was almost 18 months to the day that he left government service and went back to the private sector. Uh, but the meeting starts, we sit down, and uh, the president thanks everyone for their 100 days of service. He welcomes Secretary Sebelius. Uh, you know, he, he says people should be spending more time with their families. Um, and you can see that like, that's not going to happen. Um, and then he, he talks about the pandemic. And he said, every department has a role to play here. And we want to make sure that our response is based on the best science available. When I took that message back to CDC, it was like you know, people were just overwhelmed uh, with, with joy that you know, here the, the, the leader of our country was saying that response should be based on science. You know, CDC is a science-based organization. And what, what we find there is that often politics is, is trumping the science. So that was very, very rewarding. But he introduced me, and, and, and I gave my talk. And I talked for about five to seven minutes. And at the end, he said, that was a perfect briefing. And I have no idea what he said after that, because I just kind of, <laughs> it was like, I can't wait to tell my mother that the president just said this. So, uh, but then we got to the question and answer. And, and uh, he asked a couple of questions, which I really cannot remember. But then Hillary Clinton. Uh, Secretary Clinton uh, asked the next question, and she said, what's the difference between pandemic flu and seasonal flu? And when she asked that question, I kind of let out a sigh of relief, because what it reminded me was that they don't know anything. <laughs> I mean, they're not in those positions of power because they're technical experts. They're not flu experts. I knew more than any of them. The only one who worried me was the Secretary of Energy, because he had a Nobel Prize. But <laughs> the rest of them, they didn't know anything about science. Her concerns and the concerns of everyone around that table were the same as the general public. They wanted to know how bad this was going to get, whether, what, they, what people needed to do to protect themselves, what the government could do to assist with that. And it was great. I was able to answer all those questions, and, uh, and, and we moved forward. And the, and the meeting ended. And John Brennan said, you know, Rich, I need you in Rahm Emanuel's office right away. The guidance that you all posted on school closure, Secretary of Education is not happy with that at all. We've got to fix it. I'm thinking, OK. And Secretary Sebelius says, Rich, I need you down the hall right now. We have, a, we have a phone call with 50 state governors to talk about state response to the flu and what they need to be doing. I said, OK, very good. And then Vice President Biden says, Rich, I need to talk with you right away. I'm supposed to go to Delaware tomorrow to give an economic talk. And I need to know, is it safe? <laughs> so here I am. I'm the acting director of CDC. I'm thinking, you know, I, like, I kind of like this job. Um, and I'm thinking, who do I go with? Do I go with the Vice President? Do I go with the Secretary of Health, who I report to? Or do I go with the? Uh, the head of national security. Well, I went with the vice president <laughs> for, for two reasons. The first reason is he, he outranked the other two. He's the vice president. But the other reason was the day before he had been doing an economic address, something to do with the stimulus plan and what was happening with the stimulus plan. And one of the reporters asked him a question that was not related to the stimulus plan. They said, Mr. Vice President, is it safe to fly? with the pandemic going on. And he said, I wouldn't get on a commercial plane, and I'm telling my family they shouldn't either. <laughs> it must have been 30 seconds after he said that that my beeper goes off in Atlanta. And it's the communications office from the White House. And they're saying, Rich, we need you to get on television right away. The vice president just said it's not safe to fly. <laughs> so I head down to the CDC TV studio. And uh, MSNBC, they're on all the time. And we connected with them. And they, they, they said uh, uh, they, would, they would have me on. 
And they said, you know, the vice president has just announced that it's not safe to fly because of the pandemic. Uh, with us to explain this new threat level is the acting director of the CDC, Dr. Richard Besser. Dr. Besser, is it safe to fly? Uh, did the vice president get it right? And I said, well, this is what we would call a, a teachable moment. What the vice president meant <laughs> was that if you have the flu, you should not fly. <laughs> because if you have the flu, you're going to put other people at risk. But if you don't have the flu, it's perfectly safe to fly. And so I took care of that one and moved on. <laughs> so at the cabinet meeting, I figured if the vice president has a question for me, I want to answer it and, and make it very clear. So he said he was going to Delaware. Could he have a meeting with all the students and you know, big campus rally? And uh, what I said was, no, there's already a campus outbreak of flu in Delaware. That's not a good thing. You can meet with a small group of people. So he said, fine, that's what we'll do. And that's what he ended up doing. So that one was taken care of. Then we, we uh, since that was finished, uh, John Brennan said, OK, come on into, in, into uh, Rahm Emanuel's office, and we're going to deal with this, this uh, uh, school closure issue. So I walk into uh, Rahm Emanuel's office and bump into somebody. And I look, and I had just done a major shoulder check into the president of the United States. <laughs> and he looks up at me, and he says, you're a lot taller than you look on television. <laughs> Which is what I get wherever I go. If anyone recognizes me on TV, they're like, you're a lot taller than you look at television. That's because they lower my chair all the way down. Um, and I said, yes. And so the president turns to Secretary uh, uh, Duncan, Arnie Duncan, and says, hey, Arnie, what do you think about this guy for, for our basketball team? <laughs> and I'm like, well, two days before, the New York Times had, had written a profile on me, and they would interviewed my older brother. And the one quote from my brother was, if you put Rich on a basketball court and give him a ladder, he still won't make a basket. <laughs> Which is true. I'm like the worst basketball player ever. And so I had to own up. And I said, you know, Mr. President, I can't shoot. He said, that's OK. You're tall. You could crowd the lanes. Um, no problem at all. And, and, and then he left. And we sat down to talk about this, this school closure guidance. Well. What we had put out the day, that day, I think it was that day, was guidance that said, with the first suspected case of flu in a school, you should close the school for two weeks, do an investigation, and make sure that there's not further spread. And the reason for that is that children tend to amplify disease. They're the connectors. They tend to spread flu to other people. Um, they, they get infected at high rates. And they can shed the virus for 10 days, 12 days. So two weeks was what we thought scientifically was the, was the way to go. And we put that out as the guidance. Well, because we didn't have a secretary, we didn't have the infrastructure in place, we really hadn't cross-cleared this thoroughly with the other departments. Well, the mission of the Department of Education is to keep people in their seats learning. And the idea that we were going to close a school with a suspected case of flu for two weeks, like, absolutely not. They were not going to have that. So uh, David Axelrod was leading the meeting. And he's like, you know, this is not good. You know, we, we, can't, we can't have this. This didn't have proper clearance. And Rahm Emanuel's down the end of the table. And he says, I'll write the guidance. So he pulls out his pad. He starts writing. And I lean over to Secretary Sibelius. And I said, you know, I'm not very comfortable with Rahm Emanuel writing science guidance. You know, what, what does he know about this? And she said, it, it's OK, it's OK. Um, David Axelrod says, you know, Rom, the president just said that our guidance should be based on the best available science. I don't know that you're the right person to, to write this guidance. Uh, and with that, Rahm Emanuel, he crumbled up his guidance. He threw it in the corner. He used some Rom words, which uh, uh, I won't share with you, and, uh, and went back to eating his lunch. And Secretary Sibelius and I left the room, and we went to take our call with the 50 state governors. And about 30 minutes into that call, the deputy communication director comes in and you know, says, you know, Rich, you know, we've made some changes to the guidance. Can you, can you look at these and see if they're still based in science? And what they changed it to was, you know, with a suspected or confirmed case of flu, the school would close for a week, at which point it would be reassessed and determined how much longer it needed to be closed. And I looked at that and said, yeah, that's consistent with the science, too. You know, but it's a different policy approach. And what it really taught to me was the importance of having that policy layer. 
uh, that there is science that can inform certain things, but there are certain judgments that need to be made that are political, that are policy, and th that's a very important check that we have, that we have in place. Uh, so the, the outbreak continued. Um, the secretary was in place, and so the, the permanent director of CDC was, was named. And um, I started thinking about, well, what am I going to do next? Um, I was ready for something new. I didn't want to be the head of emergency response for the rest of my career. Uh, I had started that job the, the day Katrina hit New Orleans and, uh, and, and felt that I had spent four years trying to improve our preparedness and, and that we had accomplished a lot, but that it was time for me to try something new. Um, and during this period, during the, uh, the, the response, uh, I'd been contacted by a couple TV networks. And they said, you know, during the response, you were, you were pretty good on television. Um, would you ever think about joining a, a network? And I'm thinking, like, network news? You know, who really watches network news? Um, I don't watch network news. Uh, I'm a public health guy. Uh, but as I reflected on it, you know, during the pandemic, we were doing polling. Uh, we had hired Harvard. And they were, they were polling the public in terms of their knowledge of the pandemic, their willingness to stay at home if they were sick, to wash their hands, their knowledge about prevention, their trust in government. And what we saw was, during the pandemic, the trust in government in the early days was as high as they'd ever seen for a health crisis. And people's knowledge of what to do was, was going off the charts. And it struck me that one of the ways we can have an impact in public health is by going directly to the public and talking to people. And if you look at those things that are driving so much of the, the health concerns and, and health costs in our country, it's issues that require behavior change. It's getting people to eat right, to exercise, to take care of themselves, to get vaccinated, to have a relationship with their doctor, to understand the, these tenets of their health. And in public health, we've spent so much time talking to other public health people. I felt that there would be value in trying to go directly to the public. And so for the past three and a half years, that's what I do. Um, and that's why a couple weeks ago, I was in Hong Kong. We were the only network covering this new strain of flu. Um, and people say, well, we're well, overhyping it. And I don't think so. This strain of flu is, is, is very interesting. And when I talk to virologists, they're very concerned about it for a number of reasons. One of the big ones is that it doesn't kill birds. And so unlike H5N1, the other bird flu strain, you don't know where this one is. It's moving. And it's silently moved across a large part of China. Now there's uh, over 120 cases reported, 20% fatality so far in terms of, of, of what they're seeing. CDC has started work on a, on a vaccine, on diagnostic tests for this. I don't think it's something the public has to be uh, overly concerned about. If I was being asked the, the question uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, how concerned are you? I would say probably a 2 on this one right now. But it's something that public health should, should pay attention to. Um, I've had great opportunities so far at ABC. Uh, two years ago, we got money from the Gates Foundation for me to travel around the globe and tell global health stories and try and open people's eyes to, to things that they hadn't thought about. But most of the time, I'm talking to people about their everyday health issues. Um, that's what I do on the air. That's what I'm trying to do in, 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 in the book. And whether it has impact, it's, it's hard to say. But, but I can tell you, uh, the, the efforts that public health agencies make to try and reach the public through ad campaigns, through their messaging. Um, the media is one of those things that for the, is really free. It, it reaches millions and millions of people every day. And if there's a way of harnessing that to get people to look at their health in a different way, that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you very much.
so I, I saved a, a lot of time for questions, so that, uh, because that, for me, is the most fun. Um, and their microphones, I don't know, people, do they need to come to the mics? or? It, it would be helpful if they could come to the mics. Or is there, do we have somebody who is, can Is there a wireless around? that could be passed? Or, uh, Yes. Could you address the wonderful topic that so many of us are concerned with today, health costs? We, we receive constantly from ABC and other networks a stream of information analyzing our productivity in the healthcare sector versus other countries, analyzing the expenses compared to other countries. What's the problem as you see it? Is there a problem? What is the problem? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think they're, they're major problems. Uh, if you look at the health care reform, the o Obamacare that, that uh, was passed, uh, it, was, it was kind of a bill that, that no one really loved. It, it did some things, but it didn't do a lot of others, and it didn't address costs at, at all. Um, and and you know, those people who favor health reform, and I'm, I'm one of them, uh, think that further reform has to has to take on the issue of cost. We spend more on healthcare here than uh, than any nation, and we don't get the returns in terms of outcomes on on, on people's health. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, once you get a system where everyone is is insured, then there's more of a of, of a consensus that cost has to be tackled. Uh, but there clearly wasn't that issue before, and I think if the first bill had had, had contained uh, efforts to contain costs, uh, groups like the AMA and others would have walked from it, and it never, there'd be no bill. You know, there, when, when you, if you look at how Clinton tried to do health care reform and it failed uh, dismally, there was no bill that, that got passed, the, the feeling was that it tried to do too much, it tried to do everything. And this bill uh, was an incremental approach. Do a little, and hopefully then do some more, and some more. But uh, there's a lot of things that, that no one likes about, about, about uh, this health care reform. Yes? Is it, or isn't it true that a person is more infected if they're harboring the flu virus prior to symptoms showing? So if I said a week or two before they show the symptoms, if they have the flu virus, you know, they could be flying all over the place. Yeah. You know, one of the... Uh, one of the things about influenza that makes it hard to control and why border control strategies don't make a ton of sense is that for the, it's really the day before you show symptoms, you're highly, you're highly contagious. And so people will, you, you can't, SARS was very different. SARS as an infection, you were not contagious until you were symptomatic. Smallpox, you're not contagious until you're symptomatic. So those diseases, having a border control strategy can make a lot of sense. Influenza, you're not, able to, you're not able to apply the same strategy because people would be coming in. It could delay it a little bit because most of the people uh, will be symptomatic at the time that they're traveling. But there's that day window, which means that it, 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 it will spread. Yes? Uh, the, the question is, is the administration changing the, the approach to, to drugs from a war on drugs to uh, one that's treating drug abuse as, as a public health issue? There's been a lot in the press lately. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not in government anymore, and so I don't know whether that's, that's moving forward. But uh, a lot of people in the public health community think that that would be a very smart way to go that this war on drugs approach has, has failed and addiction is, is a, a public health issue, um, not one that can be really dealt with uh, in, the, in the courts. So I, I mean, personally, I think that there will be more movement in that direction, but I don't know uh, politically what, what, will, uh, what will be doable. Yes.
question is, what, what's the downside on the legalization of marijuana? Um, on a public health side, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a data guy. I, I'm not sure what the data show on that, whether legalization of marijuana changes perception and uh, increases use, and whether that leads to use of other drugs. Um, you know, I, th I think that from a, from a resource side on, on law enforcement, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a lot of resources going after people who are smoking pot. Um, but I, I don't know the data well enough on, on, uh, on, on that to really, to really be able to give you a good answer. Yeah. During my period there, yeah. no, very I, no. I mean, I mean, I remember long debates about border closure because even though there was disease in the U.S., there was a lot more in Mexico, and it would have been very easy for the administration to say we're going to channel, we're going to we're going to close border with Mexico, or we're going to uh, in some way impede flow because there were so many people who thought that that was. So, many, so, many, so much of the public thought that was a good thing to do, and it would have been a waste of resources. Uh, you know, all that was done was handing out car, information cards at airports that if you have flu symptoms, you know, see your doctor, here's why. Uh, I wouldn't generalize. This, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about this particular response um, and what took place. You know, I know. Um, I, there was a there was a former ambassador who was visiting CDC during this response period, and he said, "You know, things seem to be going so well. Um, what do you see as as you know one of the major factors behind the success of this response?" And I said, "Well, I think it's we don't have a Secretary of Health." <laughs> and he said, "You know, I don't think I'd lead with that answer, <laughs> but but." In reality, it was one of the things that early on uh, was very helpful because we were very nimble. Uh, it led to problems in terms of some policy, but it allowed us to act very quickly. Um, over time, this administration has gotten as tight or tighter in terms of controlling message than the, the previous administration. Um, and uh, it's very hard. You know, now that I'm on the other side as a journalist, it's very hard at times to get to talk to people who know what they're doing. During the Fukushima nuclear uh, disaster, um, I knew who some of the leading people were in the country that I wanted to talk to about the response and about the risk, and I couldn't get them to uh, clear to talk to me because there was a, such a tight hold on, on, on the message. Um, and that's, that's not a good thing. You know, the, the problem with the, that administrations face with, with open access to the media is that people are going to make mistakes and they'll say something wrong. And the response to that can be either just a correction that they got it wrong or it can be a, you know, a circling of the wagons. And this administration on a lot of health issues has, has circled the wagons. In the back? Yeah. yeah, so the question is, you know, although it was no, 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 what, what do we know about deliberate pandemics? Um, that's always something that's considered when there's a new infection. Could this be something deliberate? Um, and that will always be, be something looked at. Uh, you know, the ability to, to, to manufacture infectious agents um, is now at the level of something a good high school student can do. Um, it's, it's, not, it, it's not that hard to do. And there's, just like there are manuals on how to make a bomb, there's manuals on how to, how to uh, you know, 
how to grow anthrax and other, other organisms that can cause major problems. So it's, it's something that always has to be considered. And you look to see, as something's happening, does this seem to be occurring in a natural way? My first experience with, with, with terrorism was in 2001 with the anthrax attacks. I was the uh, uh, liaison to the FBI uh, in Florida. And you know, it, was, it was pretty clear when the first person was sick that it didn't seem to be something that he got from a stream, although that's what the Secretary of Health at the time had said. Uh, you look at, at whether this is something that could be uh, delivered or whether it's naturally occurring whenever something uh, happens. Yes? Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a long list. All the things you mentioned are, are critical. Um, up until recently, all flu vaccine had to be grown in eggs. And so manufacturing facilities, it would be tens of thousands of eggs that would be growing up the virus, and then the virus is, is, uh, is killed and modified to, to make a vaccine. That's a very tedious process. There's now licensed cell-based manufacturing of, of vaccines, which can take place much faster. But there's still not the capacity to make a vaccine fast enough. And that was one of the failures in 2009. It took uh, a good six months to get enough vaccine for, for, uh, to start immunization programs. So we need, we need still improvements in technology. We need to develop a flu vaccine that protects against all strains of flu. I mean, what other disease is there that people have to get vaccinated against every single year? If you think about measles, you get the measles vaccine once or twice, you're protected for the rest of your life. We need you know, immunologists to figure out, is there a way to do that for a flu strain, which would take the, the worry of pandemics off the table. You, know, you, you would get vaccinated against flu and you're protected. We need better antivirals because the, the treatment for flu, Tamiflu, although we prescribe it, it, it uh, is a pretty lousy antiviral. It uh, reduces your illness by about a half a day. Um, which isn't, isn't a, a lot. Uh, hopefully, it reduces hospitalizations for pneumonia, but the data on that are really shaky as, as well. Um, and then we need much better policy in place uh, across different, different uh, departments. If you look in 2009, we were telling families to keep their kids at home if they were sick. Well, a lot of people in America have no sick leave. And so you're saying to a, a mother or father, your child should stay home. Well, who's going to stay home with the child? If you stay home, you're not getting paid. If your child stays home, they're not getting school lunch or school breakfast. And you know, there are all kinds of policy uh, initiatives that have been laid out that have never been acted on to you know, provide the coverage so that people could do the right thing. But right now, uh, you know, there are all kinds of barriers, even if people want to do the right thing, to, to having them do it. Yes? I think that, that uh, if there were uh, spread from person to person, there would be travel advisories. Right now, uh, you know, the amount of information that's been released is better than it used to be, but it's still not as much as th it, it should be. Uh, it sounds like there have been some clusters of transmission within families, but not beyond that. So without person to person spread, um, I, I think that there wouldn't be a travel advisory. I think it, at this point, uh, you know, if you're traveling to China, staying away from the live bird markets would be a, a smart thing. But even there, they've tested thousands of birds and found, found flu, I think, in, in about 40. So you know, many people are thinking there may be another animal involved, you know, maybe pigeons, uh, but that the story isn't, isn't over in terms of how it's, it's transmitting. Some countries have banned the import of uh, Chinese uh, poultry. Hong Kong hasn't, they're, they're, they do the testing. But they test 30 chickens out of a lot of 1,000. Um, and I don't know that that's a robust enough sample to pick it up, given how, how rarely it's, it's being seen. But some of the surrounding countries have already put in uh, bans on, on uh, Chinese poultry. Yes?
what? Is there any coordination between environmental protection, the CDC, uh, Department of Energy, and should there be more? I mean, is, is there any great overview looking at the health consequences? Of radiation. Of radiation. Yeah. Of, of other uh, environmental. Yeah. So the question with the, with the fallout from Japan, is there coordination between CDC, Department of Energy, and EPA? Uh, there's more that's been said about risks within in Japan. Those are the three groups within the US that tend to work most closely on radiation issues. Um, and I think it was Department of Energy that was the lead. I can't remember if it was Energy or EPA that was lead during Fukushima in terms of talking to the press. Um, and there was a lot, of, a lot of testing that was being done by US agencies as well. This, the, it sounds like we weren't getting such a clear picture from Japan at the time in terms of what they were really seeing. And that's, that's a little frightening. You know, what, you wanna, what you wanna model in terms of US behavior is, is as much openness as you can when something happens here to try and encourage others to do the same because uh, you know, it, nothing stays within borders. Radiation doesn't respect borders. Germs don't respect borders. And uh, with global travel, uh, it's, it's incredibly fast for any infectious agent to, to uh, reach, reach our shores. And uh, you know, in terms of travel of radiation, that, that spreads as well. Yes? Could you please explain the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic? And when does an epidemic become a pandemic? And how do you? define what an epidemic, a pandemic is. All right, so did everyone hear that question? Yeah. yeah. So, so taking it down a level, you've got an outbreak, you have an epidemic, and you have a pandemic. Um, and you'll read in textbooks different definitions, but in terms of practical application, a lot has to do with what kind of response you want to get. When you're, especially between outbreak and epidemic, right? We have an epidemic of colds every winter, right? It just goes everywhere. Everyone gets a cold. Um, you see an outbreak of foodborne illness in a community from a restaurant or a church supper, or that, that kind of thing. Um, when you're looking at pandemic, WHO has definitions in terms of a pandemic, how many distinct geographic regions have to be involved before it, it's officially a pandemic. And they have a pandemic scale of one through six that it, that it goes up. Um, but what I was always saying during the 2009 pandemic uh, was that there's a period where WHO had not declared a pandemic. And they're in charge of, of declaring the flu pandemic. What I would say, reporters were always asking, is this a pandemic? Is this a pandemic? I said, if you're living in a community where flu is already happening, where this is already there, you're in the middle of it. It doesn't matter what you call it. You have to respond to it. And when, when you look at a flu pandemic, it's a series of outbreaks that are occurring over time at different paces. That's why you would see a different response going on in New York City than in Chicago early in 2009, because they hadn't seen any flu in 2009, and New York was seeing it in, in, in schools. If you want to get people's attention using the word epidemic and pandemic, you'll get a lot more attention than you will calling it an outbreak. And so you'll sometimes hear um, people use the word outbreak just to kind of calm it down a little bit. Um, I, last summer, I went to Uganda to report on uh, Ebola uh, uh, outbreak. Well, it was, it was a limited number of cases in a defined geographic region. If it had spread across a, a broader region, they probably would have used the term epidemic rather than outbreak. Thank you. You're welcome. This doesn't rise to the level of a pandemic, but I was very impressed with the response of, the, of all of the medical people in Boston. And I wonder how does that happen? They're not Israel. Yeah. They don't expect it every day. Well, I, you know, I got to say that, that there was a lot of preparation. It's not accidental that Boston did so well. There was a lot of training of first responders. Um, there was a program, actually, that uh, when I was at CDC, that Health and Human Services and CDC were involved in called the Six Cities Project that brought together 
cities from around the world that had experienced terrorism. So there was experts from, from uh, London, from uh, I think it was Madrid, and from Tel Aviv. And they came and shared their experience with leaders in the United States to say, here's what we did when there was that big bo train bombing in, 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 in Spain. There was the subway bombing in England. There'd been all the bombings in Tel Aviv. And they talked about how you triage patients, what you do in the field, how you distribute across hospitals so that no one hospital is, is totally overwhelmed, what to expect. Uh, you know, the hospital that's closest to an event will get all of the walking wounded. So they'll be inundated by people who are injured but not so seriously injured that they have to go by ambulance. Um, you may have to take people to the, you know, further outlying hospitals in order to address that. And Boston, um, Rich Serino, who had been in charge of emergency response in Boston, um, is the number two at FEMA and had done incredible preparedness work in Boston before he, he went to FEMA. And so it wasn't just you've got all these academic hospitals in Boston that know what they're doing. They worked at it. The city took it seriously. They prepared. Um, and, and that really pays off. But that's why you know, the early comments I made about, about not putting, about getting the mix wrong and not paying for preparedness and just wanting to focus on the existing health problems, if you're not able to invest in, the, in what it takes to be ready, then something like Boston happens and you see a lot more lives lost. So they did a terrific job in, in Boston. None were, I believe. What's that? None that came in alive were lost. It was, is, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that is right. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's pretty incredible. They, know, they knew what to do in terms of triage in the field and getting people in as quickly as possible. So it was, it was a, a very, uh, uh, I mean, for a horrible event, they, they did a, a tremendous job. How are we? Do I think we have time for one more? Last question. <laughs> there. What, what happened to see the uh, response of a local sort of help? How do I see that? Yeah, I mean, one of the things with, with the, the federal budget cuts, a lot of public, local public health is funded off of federal funds. And there's something like 30 or 40,000 local public health workers who have lost their jobs over the course of the past eight years. And so the, the capacity is way, way down. Um, you'll see, you know, I have the utmost respect for local health departments, but they're being asked to do more and more with less and less. And it means that when something uh, big or bad happens, there's not the reserve to, to really get the job done. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.